So live. I heard a bell. Yeah, that was me. I heard, I, a, I heard a kitchen bell. It was a little triangle. So good morning, folks out there. I'm going to let uh, YouTube catch up for a second, and I hope you can hear me. This is Mark Silber calling you from Carmel. And whatever time of the day it is, wherever you are in the world, I welcome you guys. And we are going to have some fun this morning, in spite of all the crazy stuff that might be going on around you. Let's take a moment to step out of that and have a creative experience here. But I want you guys to remember, you know, these things that we have talked about to stay sane, keep your head out of the crap. Make sure if you can, not everybody can do this, but if you still can, like in my town, I can still go on walks. That's really therapeutic. Get your attention off of all the other stuff. Don't look at your phone. Don't look at anything mechanical. Just look at trees and rocks and people and whatever else. You can stay six feet away from them. That's fine. Do that. And do something creative, which is what you're doing right now. I highly recommend, I use my journal. I just burn through my, uh, I don't know, 30th or what. I, I've lost track, but I just started a new one this morning, which is always kind of a neat experience. And uh, put order into your surroundings. Like I am going to do that this weekend. Just put some order into your studio or whatever you call a studio, even if it's a corner of a desk. That's your creative environment. Spend some time putting order into it. Okay, without further ado, let's bring Dan the man on here. So yeah, that's here me. we are, Dan, from live from New Mexico and California. Bingo, yes. Dan. Always good to see I am, you. I am representing. Oh, hang all on New one Mexico. second. We are missing your audio. Just a second. Folks, <laughs> bear with me because we're going to get Dan's audio in here. Aha, I may have muted it by mistake. I didn't. So let's see what's going on. Can you guys hear me? Uh, let's see. I I'm need in the chat. Your audio working, Dan, and I think it's because Skype might not have... Hang on. Correct. Let me check Audio something. Setting. Let's just check this out. Yeah. Okay. And under calling, I've got a. We are set that way. Okay. Oh, we've got all sorts of comments going on. That's always nice. We do. So we got. We got. Uh, uh, someone, Sandy, just said yes. We can hear you both. So okay, everybody good. can hear me. Okay. Audio is good for both. We can hear you both right on. Yeah, we're set. Awesome. Okay, so welcome, well, Dan. And thanks. Uh, <laughs> it's this is our this is get, this is getting to become a, a habit here, a regular occurrence. What's happening? I know we're 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 like finding we're using this opportunity to connect, even though we're distant. We're still connecting, <laughs> even though we're socially yeah. distant. We are certainly together on the internet. So you know. We were, we were going to talk over kind of a continuation of what your uh, one of your recent films was, which is the advantages of using a single lens. I certainly yeah. know what they are. You know what they are. But let's talk it over. Yeah. What do you think? What are some of those advantages? You know, I was thinking about this earlier, and I think we, I, could have, I could just totally sum it up with the idea of being lazy. Of not wanting to carry, but but I think there's more to it than that, and there is some truth to the idea of being lazy because, you know, maybe I fall into that from time to time. But I think I, I go back to school, photography school, right? And I went to University of Texas at Austin, got a degree in photojournalism, and, you know, when you get into photography, it's easy to get enamored by the equipment and you're kind of distracted initially because you think oh if I just get this piece of something then it'll lead to this because I already saw somebody else do that and that's what they were using and I better get that same thing because you just don't have any idea what you're doing you don't realize but there is an important distinction to make early which is 
you know, a, a Leica rangefinder makes a very different kind of picture than a Canon, you know, EOS one with a 70 to 200, right? Those are two, two totally different totally. tools. <clears throat> I started in the newspaper industry. That was the first job I ever had. And newspaper photographers don't get a lot of love in the photo industry, especially now because the news industry is in such trouble. But news photographer, if you're going to train to be a photographer, there is no better training ground than a daily newspaper. And I got lucky because I got an internship at a paper that was somewhere between three quarters of a million and a million daily subscribers. And the journalism world did not suffer fools, and the journalism world did not suffer people who made mistakes or didn't know what they were doing. If you made a, a, a critical mistake, they would just fire you on the spot. That was if you it, made right? a mistake, Yeah. If you made a mistake on a caption, they said, don't come back to the paper. Like, you're fired. And so you had to really have your, have your act wired pretty tight. And so, But the newspaper required a specific kind of camera and lens combination because every day was so completely unlike the next. So like you could, in the morning you might shoot a forest fire and then you might shoot a portrait of the mayor and then you might shoot a high school basketball game. So you couldn't just shoot a Leica rangefinder because you couldn't use it for all those things. Right. So everybody was using SLRs. Everybody, when I started, everybody was shooting fixed lenses, 24, 35, 28, 50s, 85s were super popular. The 180 was a very popular lens. There were no quality zooms, right? They were just zooms were shit at that time or crap. Sorry for that. So we know that word. Yeah. So all of a sudden, Canon came along with the EOS one, and Canon came along with a version of autofocus that ever, just blew everyone away. So immediately, the industry flipped from being a Nikon heavy industry to a Canon heavy industry. And the two lenses that became the staples were the 20 to 35 and the 70 to 200. And pretty much every press photographer, every photo journalist I knew switched over to this equipment. That equipment provides a certain style of photograph. And so when you're at a paper and you can't physically move yourself because of a police barricade or restrictions of where the press can go, you had to have a system that could cover ultra wide to long. And so that was that was it. But at the same time, I'm shooting every single day. Right. I'm shooting all of these assignments and I'm also carrying a Leica with me. I didn't get to use it a whole lot, but on the projects that were more my projects and less paper projects. I found myself really falling towards the Leica and saying, this is kind of the, the gear that feels more like me than this giant Canon stuff. So 95, I went to Guatemala, 96, I went to Cambodia. That, those were the first trips that really got me out into the international scene and doing international projects. And I realized very quickly at the end of the Cambodia trip, I realized the end of the Cambodia trip that I wanted to be a, I was a Leica photographer more than an SLR photographer. Once I made that decision, um, again, you go through this weird delusional phase where you're like, I need a 24 and a 35 and a 50 and a 75 and a whatever you get for the Leica rangefinders. And then you buy all this stuff and you end up using one of the lenses way more than anything else. And so you realize, you know what? I don't need a 24 and a 35 and a 50 and a 75. I just need a 50. And that's it. And you, you realize, okay, everything else is kind of getting in the way. And, I, I, and I'll give you a story. I, I used to teach photo workshops, and I still do from time to time. I was supposed to teach in Albania in May. And you, I go to workshops, and I haven't taught any many for, for a few years. I kind of got tired of doing it. But I would see students show up. And they would show up with backpacks filled with equipment. <laughs> and they, they'd go out in the morning and we'd start shooting. And, and you're watching them on the street and they're not shooting. They're fumbling with everything that they have with them. The backpack, multiple lenses, multiple bodies. Some of them are trying to use their phone at the same time. They're trying to be on social media. They're trying to do all these things that basically are impediments <laughs> to actually making good photographs, which is – you don't want anything in front of you that's going to impede this. And most people with all of their modern equipment and technology and all this stuff, it just, it's a nightmare. It, it, and so basically what I would have to do over the first two or three days of the workshop was to untrain people on what they, what they had been taught to understand about equipment. I mean, some people would say crazy things like, well, I took a workshop with someone and they said that, 
there's never the first 40 or 50 images are never good. So every single scene that you shoot, you have to shoot over that many images to do that. And what? I'm like, who told you that? Like, what what workshop instructor would ever what say kind that? Of crap so, is that? The other thing too is that when you have all this stuff, you're reluctant to carry it. So people ask, I get this question probably once a week from someone in the world that reaches out and says, I want to buy a camera, what do I buy? And I always say, buy the smallest thing you can possibly buy because otherwise you are never going to carry it. And so if you true. don't carry it, what's the point? And oh, by the way, I don't mean carrying it, carry it inside of a bag. I mean, it has to be out all the time. And I learned that the hard way. I have a whole bunch of bags that I love and they're awesome and they work for transport. But whenever I get where I'm going, that camera has to be out 100% of the time. Otherwise, obviously, it's useless. You're just carrying around a weight that's going to eventually destroy your back like mine. That's amazing. Well, hey, you know, taking that whole concept and, you know, I just had this fantastic idea. We should do a virtual workshop. Hey, we're stuck at home. We can still learn, right? And do an, do an actual workshop. That's something we'll have to play around with. But, you know, Dan, Ansel Adams took your point of stripping away all the obsession about gear even a step further. Everybody would show up for his workshop with all these different, you know, whatever, 8x10s and Hasselblads and blah, 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 blah. And he handed them day one a piece of a cardboard with a, with a frame cut out in the center of it. Yeah. Right? And he yeah. said, okay, this is what we're going to use today. And they're like, what? You, you've got one, right? A framing card. That's it. Bingo. Yeah. And everybody. I give, these, I give that, them to students. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. That's awesome. We should get those out to people. But that's what he did is he's, okay, no camera, no gear, just you and your eye going out and, and framing. I mean, you do it. I, I, you know, just do it with your hands. That makes a nice frame, you know, or you can go like that. Yeah. But that just strips all the gear away, like you said. And then you build on top of it. But let's not forget, it's about your vision but, and what you see, right? Well, I think what we talked about this before we started the call, but, you know, we, we've deluded ourselves through technology into thinking that photography is easy, right? You buy all this stuff, you have the great software, you have a new laptop, a new archiving system, and you have the latest gear. But photography now is just as hard as it's ever been. And so the problem is, for a lot of people, is that the outside world is terrifying and the and the equipment world online is a nice little warm blanket because there's an endless conversation online about meaningless stuff. Yeah. And then you take your equipment and you don't maybe you don't have a lot of training, maybe you're new to photography and you go out in the field and the vast majority of images that every single photographer worldwide makes just don't work. They're not good. So your ratio, your your failure ratio is far higher than your success ratio. And so, and that doesn't feel good often. And it also doesn't look good online. I mean, people online try to present the idea that they're perfect, that their lives are perfect and their software and their computer setup and their cameras and filters and everything else. And it's all a facade. It's a joke to build following. So if you're going to be a good photographer, you have to have thick skin. You have to have, you have, first of all, you have to get used to people telling you, no, you can't photograph here. And secondly, you have to get used to going home and looking at negatives or digital files and going, man, I did not get it. I missed it. I blew this. I was close, but I blew it. And you may go out 10 days in a row and not get anything. And that sort of reality doesn't fit modern online photo artificiality. It just doesn't. Everybody's trying to make it look like hey, everything's wine and roses, and I just did this and that. And you're like, look, this is, you know, it's just not good work. Yeah. And you, you know, it's like you got to get up to capture the, you know, that early morning light. You got to get up at 5 a.m. and that maybe sucks, you know, and it's like and it's rainy and cold and miserable. But you want to get that photograph. It's not like you're going to get it at so, 11 in the afternoon, 11 in the morning. Right. Here's another interesting little thing about con consolidating on a single lens or, you know, Here's here, here's the reality though. Let's say that you you're like me and you like the 50 millimeter more than anything else. It's it's kind of irresponsible. Let's say that you're doing an assignment in Peru. It's irresponsible to go to Peru with a single camera and a lens because if something happens to that, obviously you're dead in the water. You've yeah. got to have redundant. You've got to have redundancy. It doesn't mean you have to carry it with you, but you've got to have redundancy. So maybe you're a two camera, two lens guy. You're a 35 and a 50. That's your that's your rig. 
what you realize is that when you get better at photography and you've worked in the same genre for years and years and years, let's say documentary work, long form documentary storytelling, that's my, what I love to do. That's my favorite thing. What you're looking for is a cohesiveness because culture is now stacked against you. Attention span is against you. Right. Focus is against you. Knowledge is against you. The familiar, everyone has a screen in front of them. They feel like they have access to the entire world. Oh, do you know about Peru? Oh, I know all about it. I saw the Discovery Channel. They've never <laughs> been there, but they say, you know, yeah, I saw a doc. <laughs> I know all about it. Yeah. So when you're in the field, you get better at this. You start to compile what you have in your head. You have a pretty good idea of what you have. And you have a really good idea of what you don't and what you missed. And those things haunt you unbelievably uh, powerfully. Is that you, you, the pictures you miss will, at least with me anyway, they stay with me way longer than the pictures I have. Isn't that but so you true? God. You start compiling in your head what you have. Yeah. And then you go, okay. And, and if you have uh, images from a 70 to 200 and a 20, 50 and an 85 and all this stuff, you are, you are trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle of epic proportion. Right. So if you just consolidate to a single lens, you immediately have a cohesiveness in terms of what look you're getting. And if you're like me and every single thing you do is it goes into print form, you know, this is we're going to talk about in a minute. Yeah. Printing is, again, where it separates the, the, the posers from the real people because you start to go, man, I don't have a cohesive story here. It looks like five photographers shot this story instead of just me. And, and also clients respond to that. You know, clients are looking for consistency, not only in the look of your work, but the fact that you can do it over and over again. You know, you could go win the Pulitzer tomorrow and there are going to be editors out there that say, you, luck, you, you lucked out. You're, you don't, you're not a good photographer. You just happen to be in the right place. And so you have to prove to me that you can do it again. So go out and shoot something that's equally as good. Man, you know, we were talking about this before we started. It's time for us to... You know, have a little revolution. Let's strip out some of this BS from the culture that, you know, oh. it's like this short, like you're saying, short attention span and comparing your work, you know, how many likes you get and blah, blah, blah. You know, none of this stuff existed when some of the greats of photography were around. Their equipment was timeless. They would use the same gear for 30, 40, 50 years. No one yeah. was judging them. You know, it was because they were true to the art form and not worried about what's going on, you know, with social media and what's, what camera do I own? And that just did not exist. So I think we should, there's something about returning back to that. That's really important in terms of being true to yourself. I mean, I think, well, if you're taught, if you use the phrase true to yourself, you can't use the word social media in the same sense yeah, that's because, so true. because social media, in my opinion, and I know this is a minority opinion, but in my opinion, it's the single most destructive development that hit the professional arts in history. I think, um, I think ultimately it has unraveled all of these industries to a level that they won't recover from. And social media is not about truth. It's not about true to self. And social media is about a facade to build following. Right. And what's right. happened, and I just did this, I spoke about this on my podcast, I see essays now in huge mainstream media outlets, right, which are considered worldwide to be some of the best media outlets out there. And they are printing and running stories that are absolute garbage because they're, the photo editors are younger, they're, they lack the skill and training that the older set had. Most of the really good older photo editors have been let go or fired or you know laid off because they were too expensive. And so people assume that if you have a lot of likes on Instagram, that you're going to be really good at shooting an assignment for such and such a publication. And the fact is that they do not correlate. They do not translate. I have seen two references in the last month of stories that were assigned to Instagram followers, but they were assigned by media organizations who thought these people would be able to produce work, resonate with their audience, and they were some of the worst photo essays I've ever seen published. If I had public, if I had photographed something like that back in the day and turned it in, I would have been fired. I would have been dressed down by the photo <laughs> editor. They would have said, you're not good enough to be a professional photographer. Go back to school. And this is common. This is what you see 99% of the time now. But here's the, the caveat to this. 
I was home visiting my mom a couple months ago, maybe not even a, a couple months ago, maybe a month ago, and I stumbled across a copy of 1996 August issue of Life magazine. And this was an issue that I had a single image in. It was the only time I was ever wow. published in the actual Life magazine. I would love to see that, by the way. So, and I did not get photo credit because another photographer, I was assisting for another photographer and he and I both shot the same event. And when it was over, he submitted both of our bodies of work and the photo editor for life, David Friend, didn't know that. Oh. And so the other photographer got the, got the byline, which is fine with me, I don't really care. But Friend wrote me this nice handwritten letter apologizing, whatever. But my point is, in the single, that one issue of Life Magazine, you had photo essays from Lucian Clerk, you had Andy Levine, you had Tony O'Brien, wow. you had Lynn Johnson, you had Stephen Wilkes, you had Rick Rickman, and you had a professional editor, a professional designer, professional writers, professional photographers, and the layouts and design of the photo essays were so far beyond anything I've seen in the last decade of in any publication I've ever come across. We are simply, the quality bar has fallen so far. It's amazing. That that, that is why photography does not have the relevance it did. Content has relevance. Photography has hardly any relevance at all because we're not printing it anymore. It's all, it's this. It's yeah. flip, 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 flip. And people, photographers are their own worst enemy. They do not understand. If your work is on Instagram, if your work is constantly on social, what you are doing is watering down your brand. You're watering yourself down because no one can produce top quality work at that pace. Nobody. And so what you're just doing, the whole feel of a print or a book is completely different. And on that note, we are going to we're going to look at some of your work. But I want to just bring up a couple of things. First of all, you've achieved a new status, Dan. Uh, yeah. You, Daniel Miller talks. I listen, man. He is so God. Maybe they meant good, but I'm. I think God. I think it's good. I'm gonna yeah, say, no, definitely not God. You know, definitely my not. son has a YouTube channel, and they his hashtag is Skate God, so I was thinking we'd make you Photo God hashtag. Anyway, uh, Look, going I'm back to social to media. <laughs> yeah. I have a skateboard. I still have it, and it, and I do not skate because, man, at 51, oh, that is you, just not happening. You take me. a fall. It, the, the concrete no. has gotten so hard. Okay, well, listen, it's, Let's. Yeah. we're going to take some questions in a minute, you guys. We've got people from all over the place. So I did want to say, like, India, we've got know. Finland, uh, Mexico, Marku. Pittsburgh, even. Marku, wow, Finland. Pittsburgh. We've awesome. got Malaysia. UK. And we got and Redlands, California. Redlands, California, and Malaysia are exactly alike. <laughs> exactly. Only, only completely different. So can we look at some of your work and kind of do a show and tell with us? Yeah, so um, these are, I pulled these earlier. This is a little, this is a spine on top book from uh, from Uruguay, but I'm actually not going to show that. I got a better one to show. This is a magazine from Uruguay, which I'm also not going to show. Hey, don't you and love this, this guys? A, this is the He's first issue us. of my magazine, which I'm also not going to show. He's just teasing us. Look at this. Because I found something else. I forgot I made Okay. Um, and it's and it's pretty beat up. But so uh, I've done some posts recently about doing magazines. I love magazines. Um, magazines are different from a book. They're they're less formal. They tend to travel around more. They're passed from hand to hand, and they also signify a serial publication. Meaning, if you get one in January, you're probably going to get one in February. They're an amazing strategic tool for anyone who's a photographer. So Blurb made a makes a magazine. And I, one day I was wondering, what's the page limit on magazine for Blurb? And it turned out to be 240 pages, which is a massive magazine. I'd never seen a 240-page wow. magazine from Blurb. So I took like 20 years of photography, and I just randomly filled 240 pages. And that's what this is. So this is there's no title on the front. There is a little shifter media you know, magazine on the title on the side. There was no intention of selling this. This was not a portfolio. This was only made as a test to see what a 240 page magazine is, and it was 50 bucks, five zero. Um, since then, it has become an amazingly uh, helpful tool to have, and it's super, super simple. So it's primarily just single images across the gutter, 
Uh, and then every 10 pages or so, let me get to it. Every 10 pages, there is a page of oversized copy, which is a story from my journal. Nice. Relating to whatever image is on the other side. Now, this image happens to be uh, at the at the political convention in downtown Los Angeles in 2000. Can you this move it over very, to the this way a little bit? Yeah. Okay. This way? Yeah, that's right. There we go. It's the very beginnings of what became a riot on the street in L.A. during the convention. And um, I was in the middle. And so I wrote a little essay about that. But what you'll notice about this this uh, magazine, this is a picture from the U.S.-Mexico border. Wow. Um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was the treaty that sort of separated Mexico and the U.S. And so I had um, I was reading about Guadalupe Hidalgo. And that day I decided to go to San Diego and make an image that was sort of reflective of what this treaty was about, because it was a really sort of cruel and un unfair uh, event. But you'll look at some of these. This is a project about Islam that I did back in the 90s when I came to California. I spent about four years working on that. Uh, this is a, pro a picture from Sicily, uh, which was a big body of work I did on Sicily. I made four trips to Sicily over the years to work on a project about religion. Um, Let me a interject a question, if you don't mind. Somebody brought this yeah. up, and I think this is a good point. So do you favor black and white over color? Or, or it, it, you yeah. do. What, what's, yeah, your, no, I, what's your criteria, I, I, just out of curiosity, when, you know, color versus black and white? Um, you know, for me, I, I'll take black and white 99% of the time. Yeah. I think, um, I think pictures, I like color and I do shoot color and I've done plenty of stories with color, uh, primarily though, back when I was working as a photographer, because, you know, there was much more of a market for color than there was for black and white. So yeah. black and white, all my personal projects have been black and white for the last 25 or 30 years. And the color was done for more commercial purposes, but uh, you know, black and white eliminates um, it eliminates having times of day become more specific because black and white is about form and angle of the light as as opposed to color temperature. So you don't necessarily need to shoot at 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. You can shoot throughout the day in different kinds of ways. Yeah. Um, film has a film has an amazing latitude and being able to shoot backlit and high noon sun and things like that, I love. But yeah, I'm, I'm I'm primarily black and white guy. But there's another consistency to this. This is a picture from, from let me turn this off. It's a picture from Uruguay. Um, I did a project in Uruguay a couple of years ago with, with three other photographers. Um, this is the back stretch at Del Mar. That's shot with a six by nine Fuji camera. Wow. I had an amazing day at Del Mar. Really? Got access to, to the back stretch. Um, and again, here's, a, here's another page of copy, and that's from El Mirage Dry Lake. But what you're noticing is that. 99% of these images are shot with a 50. It's a 50 mil on a Leica and an 80 mil on a Hasselblad. And those two, that's what I carried for years and years. That's my my favorite sort of combination. Here it is, folks. And, this is yeah. what he's talking about. This is an M2. What were you shooting with? Uh, some of these were M4 and M6. Yeah. yeah. You know, again, 50, 50 mil, El Mirage, Sunrise. Fantastic. Uh, there's color in here. Let's see. I saw a pic. Oh, I love this. There's one color I'm not going to show you because um, I don't have permission from the guy. But let me let me find. Uh, there's a picture from Panama in here I really like. There's a few from Panama. Uh, this is. These are crushed beer cans on a street in Panama. Whoa. And that's all shot 35 millimeter. That's with the Leica. I went to Panama with two Leicas, and one had color and one had black and white. And I just shot snapshots. I didn't have um, I didn't have a project in Panama. A friend had a project. Uh, Andrew Kaufman out of Miami had this project on the Panama Canal, actually on Panama itself. But he did a project on the uh, expansion of the Panama Canal. Actually, I was with him when I shot that. That's on the Panama City side of Panama, and those are boats getting ready to uh, enter the canal from that side. That's amazing. But um, let me see if um, I, I know there's a color. There's a few color images scattered in here just for fun. Oh, this is a really one I really love. This is from Uruguay. Oh, I love that. That's Hasselblad with an 80. Whoa. And in Uruguay, again, I just had a Leica with a 50 and a Hasselblad with an 80. And, and you know, when I do projects, I don't have to think about it. I just go, look, it's 50 on the Leica, Hasselblad with an 80. 
Um, or if I'm using the Fuji now, I just have the 50, um, whatever this weird Speedmaster thing is. Let's see that, by the way. Can you can you uh, show us what you're shooting with there? It's just um, it's a it's a XT2, but it's um, it's I have a 50 a Fuji 50, which is great. Yeah. And this, but here's why I like this is uh, it's manual focus, and it kind of reminds me, you know, the Fuji's not a substitute for the Leica, it never will be, but when you're manually focusing, it kind of reminds me of using the Fuji fit, uh, the Leica 50, yeah. so I like it. And, it, you know, it's not as fast as the autofocus Fuji one, but I don't care if I miss a picture here and there, whatever, or if it's not tack sharp, I don't really care. Here's the Hasa yeah. that Dan's talking about. Man, you've it's got just the, a piece you've got of this. it's a piece of it's art. It's just a box. It's you just know? a box. But for those it's, of you who haven't used one of these, I mean, you're looking down like this, and one of the yeah. advantages of it is when you're photographing people, you don't have this camera stuck right in front of your face, and it it eliminates a barrier between you and your subject. It's really great for that. Yeah, you can get right up on people when you're with a waist level finder. And if you take off the lens and the finder and the back and everything, you're just you have literally a metal box. It That's is. all that camera is. Um, they are they're kind of quirky, you know, historically. A friend of mine wrote me last week and said, Hey, my Hasselblad's jammed. Do you have any idea how to fix it? And so, you know, historically Blads always had they were quirky. You, you um, gotta service them all the time or else they you know. yeah you gotta you gotta use them and service them but they're really fun and they're, also the square format is just a, a, a mind it'll blow your mind when you don't have to think about vertical versus horizontal and you're just shooting a square it's a really liberating kind of thing and it's a beautiful very sharp very simple system that um, I have those, that combination, the Leica in the 50 and the Hasselblad in the 80 for me were my favorite all time combination. I don't use them much anymore because I don't get chances to shoot that kind of thing. And logistically where I live, it's, uh, impossible for me without shipping film to Los Angeles and having it scanned and everything. So I've sort of, um, I've sort of moved over and just come to finally come to grips with trying to utilize a digital camera system in the way that, you know, will make me happy. And that's really, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing assignments anymore. Thank God. So yeah. I'm, I don't have to appease other people and the stuff that I shoot now is onesie twosie. And, um, you know, hopefully when the virus, uh, when we have a solution to the virus and we all sort of come out the other end of the tunnel, there are definite projects that I'm working on, um, that are, I cannot wait to get back to you. A project I'm working on now, which I'm not going to talk about, is one of my all-time favorite things I've ever worked on. And um, and I've been isolated away from it for over a year, so I have to get back out there. All right. Well, listen, let's take a few questions. Yeah. The project I want to get you on working on is making a full-on course. What do you guys think? Give me thumbs up if you are interested in seeing a complete course from Dan. So... Um, Oh, wait, hang on a second. I want to see this comment here. Yeah, there's a few this questions here we should pick up. Where can where can people get your books? Can they get them? From uh, you know, I don't really. Here's here's the thing about books, my books. I don't make I don't really sell a lot of books. I don't have any intention of doing that. So the books that I make, for example, the only thing that I have for sale on my blurb author page is a magazine series called Essay. Right when I've done four issues so far, but what I'm telling you right now with 100% certainty is, do not buy my magazines. That is not why I made them. The only reason I created SA and created four issues, and I'm working on issue five right now. The only reason I did that was to show you how easy and strategic and fun and affordable it is to make your own. Don't buy my magazine. My goal is to get you to make your own, and if you want to sell yours, go ahead more power to you. But someone wrote me the other day and said, I just bought a copy of, you know, issue four, or issue three or whatever. And I was like, oh, I would have just sent, if I had one, I would have sent him one because those were done very quickly. So the design needs improvement. The stories need better editing. I did them because so many photographers I was running into, especially professionals, they just couldn't make anything. They were so stymied <laughs> by the industry and being an Instagram and like, am I going to be popular? Or am I not going to be popular? And I'm like, who cares? Why would you not? If you can do something, if you can make a magazine for six bucks that showcases your work the way you want it to be seen, why on earth would you not do that? 
what I that was the that was the point behind me making any of this. So I don't have any other books for sale. But, and the only reason those are for sale is because I needed something public in my bookstore. That's it. Well, here's what we're going to do. When we put your course together, the end result of it will be putting your own magazine or book together, right? I mean, it's let's, essential. Let's do that. And I don't want you guys to buy his magazine. So for that reason, no, we're going to put a link in the description so you know not to go there to buy anything. OK, just make yeah, sure you don't, don't go there. But we're going to put the link buy. there so that you know not to go there. and buy it. This is a great question. Can I, yeah, can I feel it. the question here? So this is from Ricardo Riccio or R Riccio. I'm, pro I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering that pronunciation. Um, he's half Italian, half Brazilian, living in Paris. Not a bad combination, I my friend. That. I'm doing a master's documentary with Magnum. Also not a bad, bad decision. Um, one question I have for you guys. When do you know the right time to stop a project? That's a great that question. That is a good question. Uh, Ricardo, you're in a very uh, specific scenario, which gives you a, a dramatic advantage, which is if you are in a program with Magnum, chances are you are working with people who are very, very skilled at editing and sequencing long form projects. And oftentimes um, there's, a, there's a natural feeling where you come to a conclusion on your own where you say, I've, I've exhausted the possibilities of this project, I'm gonna move on. And there are other times when you need to get a second opinion where someone can step in that's a skilled editor and say, oh, you had your story a year ago. Or they'll say, you've got holes in this, you know, you're, you're missing X, Y, and Z. And then you go back in the field. So um, I, because I don't work as a photographer anymore, I'm not really trying to impress anyone. I do projects and then when I feel personally that I've accomplished what I needed to accomplish, I move on. Uh, had, were I doing a project, let's say that the state of New Mexico hired me to do a project and they said, we need you to document whatever, um, you know, border issues in New Mexico. I would work on that, but I would also, in Santa Fe here, there are three or four people that are mentors to me that I would go out to, Norman Mouskoff, Tony O'Brien. I would say, look, um, am I on the right page here? Am I ready to stop? Is there, what am I missing here? So that's a great question. Awesome. Let's take one or two more and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, we've got a lot of thumbs up here, Dan, as far as you doing a course. So we're just going to have to figure this out. I mean, I need a, I need an I need an assistant. I need a team of assistants, little little powerful people that could stay here in my studio, low maintenance. And um, because I am like so busy right now with with blurb and other things that um, it's hard. You better watch out. Tomorrow morning there'll probably be a knock on the door, and and half the people on this <laughs> chat will show up. Okay, uh, we are in full quarantine here in New Mexico. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, let's see. Uh, Let's take one more question. Who has a question? Um, oh, here's a here's a funny one. This is not a question. Clinton Asmus. I don't know where Clinton's from, but there he is. said, laugh, laugh out loud. I do own all the issues of, S of essay. They inspire me to realize what's possible for me to create on Blurb and MagCloud. So he did not get my advice. He bought them all before. <laughs> don't I buy his. People, don't buy his. Don't magazine. buy these things. It's not to say that there are, aren't decent photography or photographs in them. It's that the overall, I look at them and I think the design is not on par with where it should be. I have no design background, number one. And number two, I did them so quickly. I did the first four issues in probably two weeks of just bang, 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 because I needed to like reinforce with people how easy this was and strategic. Awesome. Well, you know what? We're going to wrap this up, you guys. And here's the deal. Keep telling your friends. We've got a lot more people showed up today. You know, look, isn't this awesome content? Bring your friends on board for the next one. We'll schedule another one, Dan, right? I mean, we're not oh, going yeah. what, anywhere. What else are we going to do? Yeah, no, I'm always, I'm, uh, I'm always game for this. I think... Um, I was fortunate because I was able to afford, um, you know, I came from what I would call an upper middle class family. My, neither of my parents went to college. They, they didn't graduate. And so for my brother and sister and I, it was really important to my parents that we got a college degree. So I was able to afford to go to photography school, even though at the time I paid more for books than I did for my entire tuition of four years of, of education, of four years of university in America. 
It was incredibly inexpensive back then. This now, that same school is fifty thousand dollars a year. I would have never been able to Whoa. afford to go there, and so I was afforded this education. And I also saw a friend of mine on the call, Paul Giroux. He's a photographer in Wisconsin. And I, Paul was really helpful to me when I got started. I actually rented a room in his house. He was a staffer at the paper that I got an internship at. And, you know, guys like that, um, Rick Rickman, Paul Giroux, there were so many photographers that helped me um, that if I can turn around and sort of share some info and data with people that might help them, then why not? Awesome. Dan, we're going to wrap things up. Thank you again for joining us. And you guys out there, a couple of things before we sign off. Dan, we'll be seeing you again shortly. I know that. Well, you guys can stay tuned. We'll, we'll get him on here. Uh, a couple of things I want to let you guys know about. First, Am I signing off? Yeah, we're, to... we're signing okay. off for now. <laughs> we'll All right, people. See ya. Okay. Love you guys for joining us. This is awesome. I love the feedback. I know Dan does too. Uh, a couple of things. We've got a pretty cool schedule coming up. Monday, Serge Ramelli, I don't know if you know Photo Serge. He's kind of like the master of Lightroom. He's going to be on at 10 a.m. Chris Burkhardt, if you've watched my channel, you know I interviewed him 10 years ago. Chris is an amazing outdoor action photographer. 10 a.m. on Tuesday. And then... On Wednesday at 10 a.m., we have Bob Holmes once again. And I haven't even begun to line up the rest of the week. So this is happening, you guys. We're actually trying to do this every single day. And it really helps to have your guys' support. What we need more than anything is just tell your friends. Get the word out. I mean, this is happening, okay? In spite of all our bad mouthing of social media make sure you do follow us follow me right there on instagram because then you can get updates on what's happening if you're on linkedin that's my name good thing about my stuff is you can find me anywhere if you just type in mark silver youtube amazon linkedin whatever facebook and uh i want you guys to use this time to, to strengthen your own creativity important because creativity is the opposite of what a virus is doing. A virus is destructive. It's actually creativity gone rampant and wild and out of control. That's not the kind of creativity we want. So one of the ways to counteract that is to move to the point where you are creating more than is being destroyed. And that's really important because right now there's a lot of destruction going on on our planet. We have to counteract that. So take all your, your remedies and do what you need to do. But the biggest thing is make sure you are being creative. And I highly recommend this book by this guy named Mark Silber. If you haven't read it, one of the things about it is it has... Uh, exercises at the end of every chapter. So when you're stuck at home, you can not only read about creativity, but you can do these assignments and that will really help you out. This is like a whole little class in itself. You can get it on Amazon. I really believe in that book because it's not just about me. It's about all the other amazing people that I interviewed in it. Okay. Make sure you subscribe. Uh, enable the bell so you get notified. Come on board for all these other cool shows. We're going to get Dan back on really soon. Share, like, leave your comments on the actual video. By the way, these videos will be up separately from what we just did. So you'll see this tomorrow. You can come back and watch it again and tell your friends about it all over again and live through this awesome experience. Okay, you guys. So... <laughs> Last thing, remember to get out and capture your own images of life. I really love you guys. I mean that. I'm not just saying that. I really, really love you guys for being part of our community and being so awesome. Okay, take care and stand by for the 
actual video tomorrow and our incredible lineup that's coming up. All right.